morning, everybody. Um, all right. Well, it's been, I think, uh, since last July that we've called a meeting in person. And so it's wonderful to see, like, gosh, I know we're to see everybody uh, in person. And um, happy to have, you know, folks that were not able to make it. I know that there's been some crazy traffic, so I've heard, uh, coming in. So appreciate the journey wherever you came from uh, to be here today. Uh, and I'll uh, pass it to our chair, uh, Kurt, to start us off and call the meeting. Great. So the meeting is called to order. And again, I'd like to welcome you all back to BTC. We're delighted to have you here. This room is available for any of the organizations that need a space. Afterwards, if you want, I can show you two other rooms as well. So this could hold pre-COVID 120 people if we set up chairs. We've got a room back there that can hold 40 that has a, a giant screen as well. And we have a small boardroom that would fit about 20 comfortably. So again, these come at no cost. Just see me if you're interested, and we'd be delighted to have you here. With that, um, let me open it to public comment. Are there any comments? No idea. The introductions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I'll take a take a stab at it. I thought you were all going to do introductions first. Um. <clears throat> uh, so hello, uh, Wes White, Salinas Planner County Home Machine and Co. President. Um, I guess just trying to voice a little bit of frustration, hopefully some, some improvements in the future. I mean, it goes back to that uh, uh, position on sweeps, I think. Um, nobody's allowed back in Chinatown. If, if they go, they put a tent or anything, they will be subject to arrest. Uh, you know, the, chief of, the assistant chief of police was highly unprofessional at this, at this uh, last, last one, just yelling at just about everybody. Um, go away, go away. So what is the real solution for this? Because there's still quite a few people who even are on cars, but we're still told to go away because they, they didn't go in the navigation center. And even those folks had to wait all day just to get, get in. So, you know, from whatever, 7, 8 in the morning until uh, midday, um, you know, three ladies and their dogs. And, uh, I mean, there, there's so much, so many people who had to go. It's like, well, how do we help them? Everyone got paid, 16 collaborative partners got paid to do what? Get rid of people and take their housing. We're talking about housing, but yet first let's, let's take it from the only real service to come seems to be law enforcement, and we, we need, that needs to change. I mean, you know, if the Coalition on Homeless Service Providers is really about housing and being a service provider, then those contracts of saying the city can just go ahead and do what they do, I mean, where is the compassion? Where is the fruition of service if you can't even find them again? And we already know this to be true. Shelter in place was actually the best time experience because everyone was scared to death that these folks were going to kill you. So let's keep them away from us. But now that we know they're not going to kill us, let's get rid of them again. And you're, you're following suit with that whole fascist attitude. And so are we about people first? Or are we about paycheck first? Because the policy and fruition of service the practice needs to align itself. Please help stop the sweeps. Thank you. Any other public comments? Uh, point of order, the public meeting is recorded. Um, this is just for posterity. It's perfectly, um, um, we have no problem with them recording this. You've always done this for the public forum, so no change to that. Um, all right. Chairperson comments, I will tie those into my presentation later. Do we have any modifications or additions to the agenda today? All right. Update on board and member applications. Genevieve. Hi, everybody. So uh, we've had, uh, last meeting, we presented over one the form that uh, invited uh, two member agencies, uh, Meals on Wheels, as well as three board members. So Sophie here, uh, Jocelyn Curran, and uh, Dominique Cohen. And it was a unanimous vote uh, to welcome both members and board of directors. Uh, and one thing that fell out of sight rule from last, uh, from last time that we included a membership was uh, Monterey County of Education. Uh, the applicant, there was a little clerical error, if you will, in um, bringing on the membership application. So we wanted to take the opportunity today to um, bring to the group to see if uh, we can include Monterey County of Education as well uh, with this vote and just take the opportunity here. Um, so the recommendation would be to uh, invite Monterey County uh, to be part of the membership alongside. And 
I would remind everyone, as we said, we're an inclusive organization. We welcome new members. This is a, a previous applicant whose application got misplaced in the electronic age. So we would like to have a motion to consider a vote to allow Monterey County Office of Education to join the coalition. Do I have a motion? Motion to consider. And a second. I'll second. Great. Um, any comment on this? Jill? I would just like to comment that the qualifications for membership include that the organization has to be in good standing and serve the um, population of unsheltered people that the coalition serves and that the Monterey Office of Education, even though it may sound to some like it doesn't do that, um, actually has a very active component that does serve um, homeless youth and families struggling with homelessness um, whose children are part of the county education system. Thank you, Jill. Any other comments? All right, may we call for a vote. May um, those who vote aye raise your hand, please, or say aye online. Okay, and thank you. Any nays? Anyone online? All right, may I ask if there are representatives of, so with that, Monterey County Office of Education is a member of the coalition. Thank you. <laughs> may I ask if there are representatives from the three new organizations, Meals on Wheels, the Bay Area Community Service, or Monterey County Office of Education. Do we have representatives here? Would you please give a, a brief intro to your organization as we welcome you into the fold? So hello everybody, it's nice to see you all in person. My name is Donna Smith, and I am the program coordinator for the Homeless Children and Youth Services Program with the Monterey County Office of Education. And my department uh, does serve children and youth throughout Monterey County uh, who are experiencing homelessness, not only with their educational needs, but I have several components to my department. We work at the Share Center, doing after school programs, and we're taking on a field trip this uh, Saturday. Uh, we also have after school programs in San Lucas and San Ardo. Um, I also have just hired a case manager that will be doing a deep dive into those harder cases that go above and beyond all of the school districts. I interact with all of the homeless liaisons in each school district and charter school, supporting them in Kinnevento law, identification, and support services such as school supplies, clothing, food, Etc. We also are part of CARS and the HMIS system. I do all of those assessments and put those in for our families as well. And uh, collaborate with all of you on different levels to uh, try to get people into housing uh, as best we can. So I'm very happy to be part of this group and uh, I enjoy collaborating with all of you as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. A pleasure to have you and your organization on board. Do we have a representative from Meals on Wheels? We will next time. Bay Area Community Services, anyone? No. Okay, they will be at the table next time. And now, the highly anticipated member updates for two minutes. So we will, we will keep a clock up here, but if we could go on two minutes, please, keep your updates to that, and we'll go alphabetically today. So could we start with Access Support Network. Central Coast Center for Independent Living. CHISPA. City of Salinas. This will go really quick to <laughs> Oh, City of Salinas. Good morning, everybody. Ah, uh, good morning. I'm popping in on Zoom this morning. Uh, apologies for the little bit of delay. Great, Rod. Um, just you're up. A uh, quick update for the City of Salinas. Um, since the last meeting, I believe we've submitted a. I don't know if we covered this in the last meeting, but the city has submitted an ERF2 application, a little over eight million dollars in partnership to support the adjacent cleanup of the Upper Car Lake encampment. Um, significant partnerships there. The city has also relocated its emergency motel program from the city of Marina to the city of Salinas. That program um, is currently operating in partnership with the county and will continue to operate over the next year. So it's operating on a April 1st to 
to May 31st schedule, we do have two options um, to renew for two subsequent years depending on funding. But that program is going quite well and is serving as a very robust feeder to the Home Key project. The one of the Home Key projects is scheduled to occupy in May. That will be 43 units. And so I think we're on schedule doing a lot of coordination with housing authority and coalition staff to identify emergency voucher holders and appropriate residents for that. Um, we are also preparing to engage on a Home Key 3 application with our partner um, Bay Area Community Service on a model that was not meeting threshold requirements for round two, but is very well positioned for round three due to the advocacy of banks. So we very much appreciate that. Um, on a personnel level, we have extended an offer to a replacement for Keisha Lopez's position, our SORT team coordinator, outreach and response. Um, we're anticipating that person to start in mid-May. And um, that is all due to Caseless Elevation as our homeless services manager. And for those who may not have heard, our um, much loved director of community development in the city of Salinas is being tapped as the new city manager for the city of Soledad. Um, I believe the formal vote from the council is tonight, and we anticipate that that will go unanimously in her favor. And she anticipates leaving the city's employment in the middle of May. So that's it for us. Thank you very much. Community Homeless Solutions. Hi, yeah, short update today. Uh, everything's going fine across all our programs. Uh, I'm happy to say we're fully staffed, except for one position we're recruiting for a part-time nurse for our respite center in Salinas. So if anybody knows any nurses looking for good work, let, it, let me know, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Community Human Services. I'm um, here by Zoom. I don't know if Sean Stone is in the room with you. Oh, no. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give the update, Robin. Thank you very much, Evangelina. You're welcome. So CHS has a variety of open positions, shelter monitors, uh, for shelter monitors, counselors, clinicians, and others. And I can provide a job description to anyone that's interested or if you know of anyone that um, is interested in those positions, you can give them my permission or send them to our website. Our youth shelter is doing very well. We just finished um, the majority of our construction at Safe Place. We received new flooring, don a donation closet, cabinets, bathroom, vanity, and, re and repairing our ceiling tiles. The only items remaining um, is correcting the sagging uh, floor in the kitchen from the upstairs and repairing the outside emergency stairwell, which is delayed due to the, it was delayed due to the weather. At Safe Passage, we're actually doing very well. Um, right now, we have four residents. One of them moved in this week, and we have another one hopefully moving in today to make it five out of six. We have just completed the repairs on all the facilities in that apartment building for our street outreach programs in Monterey Peninsula, in Salinas Valley, and South <coughs> County. They're doing well, just over 65 clients in total. There has been a recent reduction in caseload due to exits from the programs. We are still searching for an office site down in South County, which we've had um, quite a bit of trouble finding a location, but are still able to maintain our dedicated outreach days in South County. For Casa de Noche Buena, it's doing well. We have a census of 27, um, and nine of which are single women, and the remaining are families. We had a couple of exits to housing last month, which is great, and we are going um, to be doing a program analysis of our exits that exited out not to housing, and to be able to explore ways to increase our exits to housing. In the recent year or so, there have been more acute cases in substance use disorders and mental health issues, so we want to do what we can to best support those cases. And lastly, for Schumann Heart House, um, construction is doing well. They are putting up the drywall this week and laying out the electrical. Construction is expected to be completed in August of this year. And that's it. Thank you very much. CSU and me, the Chain Center. Hello, good morning. So our update would be short and sweet. And you guys are doing, you know, terrific work. I'm like, wow, I got to follow me on that. <laughs> 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 
So right now, we're basically, we're still working with the city to operate the um, EMP program that's been moved over to Phoenix. And as Rod mentioned, um, lots of our clients are heading towards um, a home key or other permanent um, housing options. So we're pretty excited about that. Excuse me about that. And we're also working with the city, county, and other community partners to conduct outreach efforts. And right now, we're really focused on the Pajaro community and then King City as well. And so that's our update. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Very good. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> and Dorothy's place. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my update will be short as well and focused mostly on housing. Um, in anticipation of the sweep that came through Chinatown, we, and, and it had subsequent delays, so we had time to move people um, that um, were in the Soledad Street location over to our Jefferson Street location as we housed assisted people into housing from Jefferson, leaving about six uh, vacancies in Soledad. Um, we were able to assist five people from the Chinatown encampment into those empty rooms and we're still processing applications for two more. So uh, maybe we'll be able to get um, one or two others up in there, but it is making our program very full again. It's a small program, it's 26 units, but um, our problem with that and with the 200 plus people that we're case managing right now is we just can't get them into housing fast enough. And it's very difficult, it's easier for the people that are in transitional housing um, to wait it out because they're in safety and security, but the ones that are still having to live in encampments or in their vehicles, um, I don't blame them for becoming impatient with the system. Um, we have submitted voucher applications for those that qualify for vouchers, and we recently found, as in yesterday, that um, after doing an audit of our data, much of, you know, quite a few of the vouchers that we submitted were submitted with incorrect data. And we're going to go through that and correct that this week. Um, but it was very disappointing for us um, to discover that. And it's something that we probably should have discovered sooner. We just didn't have the capacity to run the right reports. But we could have asked the coalition to do it. And I encourage the other applicants for both the homeless set aside vouchers and the EHVs to do this. Um, audit your data and make sure that the case manager's contact information is there so that the housing authority can reach out to your agency when it becomes time to do the briefing for the consumer. Um, that's where we found we were lacking. Many of those applications didn't have that filled out correctly. Um, so we're correcting that um, and and really disappointed a little bit in ourselves because a lot of these people have been enduring a very hard life for longer than they should have had to. But we're going to make that correction. Um, and the last thing, um, very shortly, the 12 units on Soledad Street will become permanent support housing. Um, we uh, received our uh, HUD grant through the COC this year and we are now briefing the residents, uh, well, have been for the last couple of months, about what permanent supportive housing means and how the terms of their stay will be changing. And we are finishing up uh, the lease and getting it ready for legal review. So probably within the month, you know, hoping that we get our funding, which is notoriously late, I understand, um, those units will become PSH. Great, thank you. Downtown streets, thing. Uh, we have been super busy. We've got a full team of 50 team members. So in terms of our uh, staff to team member ratio, we are at capacity. Um, we have a wait list, and so it's, we can kind of continue to serve folks as they show up. Uh, through our rapid rehousing program, as of Friday, we will have housed 11 households and 18 individuals since uh, July 1st, and we'll continue to work on all of that. Um, and the last bit is that we completed the Soledad Special Project um, in collaboration with county and city partners and it was incredibly successful. We met uh, a bunch of new individuals, conducted CARS assessments, and connected them with services 
um, and they were not evicted. They're still there. They're in the space where they're staying in a substantially less three, three forty cubic yard dumpsters or less. So our team members are really proud of, of all the work that they did there. And we are still chatting with uh, the city of Salinas about launching two LSL teams. Uh, which would be five team members on each team, and that uh, conversation is kind of delayed, but it seems like it will be able to launch come um, July 1st, pending other delays. And so that is that's kind of where we'll folks are. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah. Eden Housen, gathering for women. Good morning. Can so, you your uh, update? Um, so sorry, can you do a quick recommendation? Can you say your name? Oh. Uh, just for a minute, so we can go sure. <laughs> Got it for a minute. Stacey Alzheimer for our guest talking. Um, nice to be here in this space again. It's been uh, four years, I believe, almost. Um, and sorry, you guys aren't here for those on the screen. Just a very short update. Uh, we have one guest transition into housing and one guest from, uh, at the shelter with two children transitioning into housing since we last met, so that's very exciting. We had a lovely Easter breakfast. Um, Lunch, and we also had a nice birthday celebration yesterday, and we all sang off key. Um, we'll have to work on that. Um, we did receive a small grant from the United Way for housing instability, so and that's going very, very quickly. But we've been helping, I think now six people stay in their housing. Um, it's not obviously easier to keep people in housing than to try and get them into housing once they're homeless, so that's been really important. Um, and we're still looking for a managing director, so I did change the description a little bit. It's less heavy on finance, but if you know someone who's interested, please let me know. Thank you. And Housing Authority for Monterey County. Housing Resource Center. Good morning, everybody. My name is Alexa Johnson with Housing Resource Center. Um, quick updates are two slopes that have increased, so we're now uh, at 90 cases at one time at our agency, which is the highest it's been since I've been at HRC. Um, in less than a year, we've hired on two new case managers and two new housing specialists, so we're six and six, which is nice. And um, so you may know that we also have a new satellite location now at United Way's Impact Center. I think we're the first agency that moved in, so it's a little lonely if you guys want to um, have some people come over there. Um, I think the idea is that if someone were to need services, they would have a representative from multiple agencies kind of all in one location, which would be really helpful, especially if transportation is such an issue. Um, our Bringing Families Home program has finally uh, kicked off. Um, if you have or know of any families that maybe are working with a CPS and maybe housing as part of their plan to reunify with their children, we have our Bringing Families Home program. Uh, the CPS uh, social worker can actually send a referral over to Family and Children Services who will then send it over to us. There's not currently a wait list, so I think now would be a really good time if you have a family in mind to send them um, and to let them know about our program, you can have them call us and we can kind of explain the referral process since it is pretty new still. But uh, we'd be happy to to serve these families in that capacity and, and kind of help reunify, reunify it that way. Um, we do have our housing workshops that I just want to throw out there every time we have announcements. Uh, if your agency, uh, whether or not you help with housing, but you have a lot of clients or customers that need help in learning how to start that housing process or how to get going while they're on a wait list waiting for housing to come, um, let us know. We'd be happy to host a housing workshop at your agency. We kind of just go over how to go about uh, looking for housing, what types of questions you can ask, um, just kind of updates maybe to tenant uh, landlord laws that maybe they're not familiar with that might be relevant as they're searching for housing. We go over budgets give them a sample application, things like that, to really help them get started and, and figure out what they can do now while they wait to, to get that housing assistance from another agency. So I think it's really helpful, and sometimes it takes a while to gather that information. Um, we will be at the Lotus Day uh, Resource Fair this Friday at the Monterey County Fairgrounds as well, so we're going to be um, advertising a lot of our programs for families in particular. Um, if you guys know anybody that would be interested Learning about those resources is a really great fair from 10 to 2 at the fairgrounds on Friday. And then lastly, just our rapid rehousing committee that we have with the coalition. We're really uh, craving 
as many agency participation as possible, especially since a lot of us are kind of dabbling in housing more and more. Um, we'd love to have your input on things like vouchers and how to go about interacting with landlords and kind of how we can all get on the same page. And that way, um, the community sees benefits in working with us um, and finding people housing. So I think that's enough. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Interim. Good morning. So we think you're here. Um, so for interim, we are also looking, and it's been, I think, more than a year that we've been looking for a place in South County as well. Um, and we are happy to partner with other agencies in finding that location. So please keep this in mind. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there are, I think we're looking to have about five to six staff um, at that location and we're flexible. Three to six staff, maybe. And we're flexible on that as well. We also have a number of opening positions, including uh, a need for a psychiatric nurse practitioner who we hope to hire by the end of the year. Uh, and we have about five vacancies at our transitional housing program, uh, Shelter Cove. The coalition has been sending us clients through cars, um, but it has been difficult to find some of those clients, um, and it's just taking, I think, longer than we hoped to get those units filled. Um, we have run out of, I'm going to say, about half of our uh, emergency shelter funding for the year already, mostly because we housed more people in emergency shelter than ever before during the rains. Um, so that's both good and bad for the rest of the year for us. And I wanted to mention that on May 12th at Sherwood Hall uh, at 11 a.m., we are having a mental health celebration. Everyone is welcome to visit our website and uh, sign up for that. Thank you very much. Mid-Pen Housing. Good morning. I'm really uh, talking about this. Um, we have one uh, vacant CLC unit we're trying to fill. I'm going to do a quick report back about an art therapy program that I shared uh, with this group uh, some months back. We have piloted this throughout our portfolio. We have 40 residents that we have been working with. These residents were highest acuity. Folks were receiving police violations and on track to be convicted. Out of the 40 to 20 therapy program on a consistent basis, and I'm so happy to report that we've seen a decline of about uh, one for pure lease violation, meaning who are not on uh, the road uh, being evicted, so we're very happy about uh, that. The other thing is that in relation to the moon gate, um, we're piloting uh, a program to get the residents involved to help keep the property maintained, and so we're going to be offering stipends to six residents for eight week periods, and that can rotate. Uh, uh, and we've determined the eight weeks period and the stipend and the amount that we would pay would not interfere with their rent amount. So really proud uh, to be offering that to the present moon gate. And then finally, uh, beginning third quarter, we're launching care navigation, bring it to all the community members there. At moon gate, we will have a care navigator on site uh, two days out of the week that we're between various mid Thank you. Thank you very much. You get the most dedicated award by coming to us from your car. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> Monterey County DSS. Hi, uh, Lauren Sawazuka with the uh, Department of Social Services in Monterey County. Um, just do a quick PSA for the department side in that um, we, we do just want to help pass along the word that there is an increase in um, some um, scam alerts over um, applying for benefits, and so please, um, uh, particularly one happening nationwide in California about a potential fee when you're trying to reapply or apply for Medi-Cal, please know that that is never, will never be the case, that there is never a fee in order to apply. Um, the other piece that I want to make sure and share is that the Community Action Partnership is actively um, attempting to gather input for our community needs assessment. The Community Action Partnership um, is the county's administrator of the Community Service Block Grant funds, and in order to receive those funds and distribute them to our community, we need to provide a poverty profile, understand um, the needs of people who are living 
um, at or under 125% of the federal poverty level. So that survey is out right now. I think it had previously gone out to this, this uh, organization's um, distribution list. We'd ask, we're still pushing for more of those. We're looking for individuals experiencing poverty firsthand to provide their feedback um, and um, input about their experiences. We're also scheduling, um, and we will announce once everything is organized, um, two in-person public hearing events. We had previously done our in-person events prior to COVID, and then the last, the, the, it's done every two years. Last time COVID kind of intervened on that, but we'd like to re-engage that effort um, in order to um, take in some of the feedback we had gotten in previous years. The intention is to hold two events this time, one um, in Salinas, but also one in the city of Seaside. So we're working with um, some of our partners at the school districts to um, potentially have those hosted at school sites. And soon they're confirmed, we'll let you know. But please, please, in the meantime, help us distribute the survey. Um, we're open to um, individuals who are not themselves. Um, uh, experiencing poverty but also need your help and your relationships with those individuals directly to help pass that along as the input is um, not not only a requirement of how we administer the funds but it's it's really important to ensure that the needs um, and how these funds are directed are by the people experiencing the issues themselves so um, we can really appreciate your help with that um, I also want to ask um, Roxanne Wilson, who I think is here, to help share another update about how the county is engaging some outreach for the Watsonville Shelter um, individuals. Roxanne? Thank you so much. Um, just really quickly, I did send an email out to the coalition board members letting you guys know that we are coordinating outreach to the Watsonville Shelter, which is managed. Um, by the county of Monterey, the vast, vast majority of those folks that are inside of that shelter, like 99% of them, are from the county of Monterey. But as if you're familiar, Pajaro doesn't exactly have places to stand stand up a very large congregate shelter. So we, we've been in partnership with the county of Santa Cruz since the beginning of the disaster. Um, there's about 31 individuals who have, who have identified themselves as pre-disaster um, unhoused. And as we have already started repopulating and reintegrating um, back into the, the town of Pajaro, there is certainly a timeline on how long we can keep that congregate shelter up. So um, if you are able to help, just go see if there's any type of services that we can connect these folks with. We are doing the outreach event um, again at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds in the city of Watsonville on Monday and Tuesday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, I don't have a timeline on when the, the congregate shelter is slated to close, but we do know that that is certainly looming. So, um, yeah, give me an email. Let me know if you guys can help. Thanks so much. Thank you, Roxanne. San Benito County, HHS. Sun Street Center. Okay, there he is. How was uh, no, 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 okay. So uh, here's a quick update. Uh, we finally started the rehabilitation of the shelter. Uh, we have relocated all uh, shelter guests uh, to a new hotel. That was certainly a process of just clearing up the entire facility. And, uh, so it's pretty much cleared 100%. Uh, We've got some help from some rulers and community homes and that's just a great job in uh, helping with that. So that is moving forward on the interior floors. We have a new, new paint job, uh, the, the roof, uh, and also the front uh, parking. So we're looking forward to this. Uh, this will take approximately a month. So our shelter place will be at the hotel for about a month or so. Um, we are still operating RVs for those that were impacted, the families impacted by the storms, they'll be there another five months. They have been there for a month already. And our goal is to get a house before the end of six months. And we are we are continuing to assess the river. There's plenty of homeless encampments, but also a lot of garbage that is dumped by community members, not only by homeless individuals. Uh, we had last Friday a cleanup of 
Cool. That was the clean up, I'm sorry, it was just a walk through to us, I saw the dumping sites, and we'll be coordinating with uh, the contractor to come out and do all the clean up. So at this point, it's only clean up, it's not uh, homeless abatement, so it's just a clean up. Um, and we'll, we're also cleaning up uh, things that homeless individuals don't need, uh, that, that is uh, garbage, so we'll be doing that. And we're also working on the home key three, and we expect to submit it hopefully in about a month or so, but I um, want to report that. Thank you. Sun Street Centers. Hi, everyone. I'm Vanessa. Uh, uh, Pro with Lamar. Right now, we moved in with family last week. We have around five families that are pending approval from the Housing Authority, so we can move them in, but we're still facing uh, challenges and barriers there. Um, it's been disheartening, honestly. Um, I know there's a lot of changes coming to Pueblo de Mar in the new fiscal year, so uh, we'll have more updates, you know, in the next few months. Thank you. Salvation Army. Uh, hello, John Bennett, Salvation Army. Um, this is the, our uh, uh, transitional housing programs, 19 units are full, they've been full basically continuously. Um, during the uh, uh, the rain disaster, uh, we housed up to 60 people uh, in our, uh, we, our former preschool had open rooms and so we offered that up to the county and that went on for about 10 to 15 days and, um, and then it was uh, finally they said that's it and they, they closed it. So that was really interesting to see that amount of individuals. Uh, at Good Samaritan Center, uh, we were seeing an increase in um, uh, folks coming in, uh, generally homeless, uh, sometimes seniors and stuff like that. And yesterday we actually, normally we have enough food and stuff like that, but we were really low on our food, which, uh, so we've just uh, had to talk to uh, the kitchen to make sure that uh, we've got enough stuff going on. Um, and then um, Jennifer Miller made a presentation last time uh, regarding uh, that she is uh, a mom now, and uh, so she won't be back till about July or August, and I am stepping into her place, which is really interesting. So, <laughs> that's it. Thank you, John. I will skip an update. I'll, I'll be doing a presentation here in a minute. That'll be included. YWCA. Okay, let's do a couple callbacks. Access Support Network, are you on? Cecil? Chispa? Eden Housing? Housing Authority? Yes, I'm here for the house authority. Oh, I'm sorry. I marked you wrong. All right. No, I was late. I was having problems getting on at first. Okay, fire away. Okay, well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we are over here working on our voucher program to see if there's anything that we can do to expedite the utilization of the emergency housing vouchers and the regular HCVs. Uh, maybe to do a preference to assist with the victims of the flood. We're checking regulations because uh, I've been told by staff that a lot of the victims, unfortunately, are undocumented. And so that, you know, creates a barrier. But we're trying to see if it's a way around it. And other than that, we're just really working on our, our programs, working with Genevieve, with the coordinated entry, and just trying to assist in all the areas that we can to uh, provide housing, as well as working on a new project for PDM that's uh, in the works. So I have more on that next time. So let's see how that goes. Thank you very much for the update. All right, I would like to announce we have a new award. It's called the Time on Target Award for those who are closest to the two minute limit that we get. So, so I was an Air Force pilot and you get judged on being on time exactly. So we had a three way tie today with three people that were one minute and 56 seconds. So the first winner is the city of Salinas. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, Community Human Services, a dead tie at 156. And finally, San Benito County HHS. So, congratulations. <laughs> All right, and now I will give an update on VTC.
You are sitting in the old headquarters of Fort Ord. This is Martinez Hall. It is named after the first Hispanic Medal of Honor winner in World War II. He was uh, Private Martinez. The flagpole out by the parking lot commemorates him with a bronze plaque, but he died in the Aleutian Islands in 1943. So he was in the 7th Infantry Division, which was headquartered at Fort Ord for most of its history. Next slide. BTC, our tagline is empowering veterans to move from crisis to self-sufficiency. We've been around about a quarter century. We are an independent 501c3. We answer to our own internal board of directors. Um, the staff varies, and I'll, I'll show you where it varies. We have a works program, and we have a lot of part-timers out there. So we're right around 50. Uh, the budget is just under $7 million a year. We were California Nonprofit of the Year a few years ago, and we were the Nancy Service Provider of the Year last year. The need, this is who we serve. So on this side, you're familiar with this, the pit count. So the number for Monterey and San Benito County is 160 homeless veterans. So that's the target we go to. Our goal is to reach what the federal government calls functional zero. The VA refers to that as any veteran who doesn't want to be on the streets has a place to go. So that's our target. This is about two-thirds of our clients, and one-third of our clients are veterans that are leaving prison. They're the long-term offenders. I'll show you we have an in-prison program. We work with them for a number of years, work with the parole board, bring them to VTC during their transitional period, and then the goal in all of this is to reintegrate them into society. The reason we won nonprofit of the year from the state of California is we've had in this program, the recidivism rate among this crowd is about 70% statewide. We've had 140 go through our program and ours is zero. Not a single person is reoffended. Next. These are our programs. This is the main slide. We have emergency housing, and I'll show you a map here. We have 10 beds. That's a federal program. Two months stay. We have transitional housing, and we have several different models. We have three models through the Department of Veteran Affairs with 58 beds total. And transitional housing through the state is 29 beds. That's the prison program. We don't refer to it as um, we refer to it as federal and state. That's easier than saying homeless and former incarcerated. So that's how we distinguish them. To us, they're all veterans. They're all treated exactly the same. The one exception is those that are leaving the incarceration have certain requirements that they must do, such as group therapy, anger management, things like this. So we work with them on a little higher level. We have permanent housing. We currently have 14. In that case, it is funded through the coalition by HUD, and we have 14 beds for that, and we are the landlord, effectively. These are the only people with tenant rights. Um, and then we also have an aftercare program where people that leave our program that are living in the community, but due to their military discharge status, are ineligible for federal services. We have a side contract that allows us to give them case management services. And then we also work in the Veterans Hub, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But we, pre-COVID, we were in five California prisons. During COVID, we were in three prisons. And now we're in, we're formally in one prison, which is in Monterey County, and I'll talk about that. But we also have feelers out to a number of other prisons, one outside of Sacramento and San Quentin. And so all together, Right now, in the Veterans Hub, we only have 200 veterans, but uh, again, I'll go to this in a sec, but it'll eventually go up to 1,200 veterans that will be served. Next. This is our housing. It's just over the hill. If you, if you went out, turned left, and turned left again, you would be on Hayes Circle. So we're sitting right here now. There are 20 buildings down there. Each of them are duplexes. They have two to four rooms on each side. And right now, we're at 100% capacity. So at any one time, we're deed restricted. We got this property through the McKinney-Vinto Act. 
and we are deed restricted to serve formerly homeless veterans and their families. We can't take non-veterans. You have to have a connection to that. So currently we have 107 veterans that are living with us. We have three spouses and we have seven children that are living down there. For these, we provide food, clothing, transportation, counseling, substance use disorder. We do the, the full range of services. These four have never been used. And again, this is, um, this is our biggest program. That's the Federal Transitional Housing. This is the prison program. This is permanent supportive housing, and that's emergency housing. And we'll, we'll send you all these slides so you'll be able to see them and I can answer any questions you might have. And one more slide. This is the Veterans Hub. It's the first in the nation. We got permission from the state of California to consolidate veterans that were qualified, that were working towards parole, and that were volunteers to move to Soledad, Correctional Training Facility Yard B, it's about half, a third of Soledad right now, is slated only for veterans. They have different privileges, and we are the service provider in the prison. We have a three-year contract in there. It's a test case for the state. We're being assessed by Boston University, at great expense, I might add, to <laughs> assess how, what changes are occurring among this. And again, it'll, it'll add about 1,000 more veterans here shortly. But uh, we have a dog program, we have a garden program, we have a narrative therapy program, we have counseling programs, we have substance use disorder. Many of the things we do here, we do inside there. On any given day, Monday through Friday, we have about four staff members that are out in Soledad. Next. Last Chance Mercantile, about a year and a half ago, VTC competed and was awarded the contract out at the Monterey County Regional Waste Management District, the dump. We're out there, and Last Chance Mercantile is run by a VTC staff, and the goal is it's a jobs program for our veterans. So we move them out there, and they work to reestablish their resume, get some money, get plugged back into the working community. It's a limited liability company, VTC. We have a management committee that oversees it, a subset of our board. It's about a million dollars a year that comes through there, which is great. It's break even for us. So when you take all the expenses, it really doesn't make us money, but it's good visibility in the community. And again, it's a jobs program, which is why we're there. At any one time, they have about 15 full-time staff, but it varies between 12 and 18, depending on the part-timers we have. The future of VTC is Light Fighter Village. This week, we will close construction just over the hill. Those four houses down on the left side of Hayes Circle will have a $52 million project that is breaking ground on May 1st. And with that, one more slide. This is what it will look like. It's funded primarily through the state, housing and community development and Veterans Housing for Homeless Prevention. So about 30 million of the 52 million came through the state. And we're very proud to have this. It is deed restricted again for veterans, for veterans and their families. It will be 64 units of single residency and then six units of family. Yes. Um, all affordable housing, it's low and extremely, in, extremely low income, so they are 0.5 average median income and below. Um, it's known as Lake Fighter Village Limited Liability Company, so it's us and a nonprofit housing developer out of San Rafael, known as EAH. They have 700 other housing projects in the state, all affordable. And one more. And the phase after that is the old VA clinic, which is about two miles south of this. VTC competed in a federal program known as Extended Use Lease, where in um, final negotiations with the federal government to get a century lease on the property. So we won't own it, but we will renovate it 
and we will renovate the existing building, which is twice the size of this building. It's 35,000 square feet. We are putting a Meals on Wheels kitchen on this side as a jobs program and also to feed our residents, which is a grant requirement. And the rest of it, we will open up to partner agencies. Many of you, we would be interested in bringing into this building. And then in the north end, we'll put housing, which will also be affordable housing for vets. We're working with CSU Monterey Bay on this. Um, we are looking to partner with them to design the housing, um, bring in some academic offices and interns into this to ultimately serve veterans and serve the community. And that's it. So, are there any questions? That was phenomenal. <laughs> Congratulations on Life Fighter Village. That is a great use of land, mm -hmm. going up a few stories so that you can get more people housed. Yes, and they'll have an ocean view from there. And again, it's all permanent housing. So we'll be the landlord, they'll be the leases. We do all the services on them. So we're very happy about that. When you put Life Fighter Village together with our existing housing and then bring the EUL, we will reach functional zero. So by the numbers, and that would be only the second county in the state to do that. So and a shout out to Art at Last Chance Mercantile and the Electronics Department. <laughs> right. That's where VHSs go to die. <laughs> Pick up a great color TV for my stepdaughter. <laughs> well, thank you for shopping out there. So. All right, next we have a discussion on the emergency housing vouchers. Yes. Do we want to, so we have a June also that's open for any agencies that are interested in presenting as well. Uh, so just wanted to put it out there, see if any agencies you want to present in June. If we don't have a volunteer, we'll go over a list and randomly pick someone who hasn't given an update. <laughs> so you're all warned. But we'd love to have you present. Um, we'll probably do that meeting live as well. Assuming COVID doesn't return, we'll probably meet here in June. Okay. Great. Perfect. And you know, actually, I got ahead of myself. We're in um, April, so we may. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, perfect. So let me learn from my mistake here. Okay. All right. So we just wanted to. So last meeting that we had, we talked about just uh, pausing the update over regarding emergency housing vouchers since there was a couple of new developments, and we wanted to provide everybody with all the information all at once. So a little history behind the emergency housing voucher, so you all have some context. Uh, in July of 2021, HUD released uh, the opportunity for counties to have access to emergency housing vouchers, which is the EHVs that we keep talking about. Uh, and uh, the county of Monterey was awarded 269 for the whole CSC region, so that's about 240 for Monterey County and 29 for San Benito County. So a little bit of the process, and this is, you know, I think uh, the picture that we really wanted to blow up and all pull curves up here. <laughs> uh, so there's a couple different stages for uh, EHVs and emergency housing vouchers, and so we want to just support um, the community with a little bit of information as to what is um, what the flow of the emergency housing vouchers looks like. Uh, so first is there's a partnership with the Continuum of Care as well as the Housing Authority. So where the Continuum of Care coordinated entry system comes in is uh, we are the referrals. So we work with our is it not shared? Okay. Um, we'll send the slides afterwards for folks to have um, accessible. Uh, and should be sharing. Okay. Well, uh, we'll send that afterwards. So uh, for the coordinated entry system, uh, we are the referral point. We're so we're the access point. So we have uh, we work with our cars partner partnering agencies to uh, collect the VI SIDATs, and then the VI SIDATs come to our coordinated entry system, and we refer them to housing authority. So that is, that's our referral system. So we do intake and assessments, referral to the public housing authority, which is housing authority of Monterey County, and then application systems and supportive services. That's uh, the part where our 
operated at Trade Cars partner agencies come into play, uh, which a lot of you here in the room, your agencies are a part of. The public, so then the EHV application process goes in. Once we put, bring the referral, the EHV intake and application process happens. So they get the, refer, the housing authority receives the referrals, and they call in um, the they call in the referrals, folks that are uh, on our referral list, and they do an intake and application process. Uh, the EHV briefing, housing navigation, and other services to expedite lease up. So I think you know, Joe, you brought up a really good point of making sure that. Uh, case managers are always attached to um, those referrals that increases and supports the housing authority in case we can't reach clients um, to contact folks that they know are working uh, with, with that client. And HQS uh, inspections, uh, so that's the housing quality, I believe, Inspe inspection and request for tenancy approval uh, processing, and then HAP contract with owner and landlord. So that is where um, they like I mentioned, the EHB application process, as well as the public agency, housing agency, which is HACO, um, comes in. And then the third stage is uh, emergency housing voucher utilization and Melissa. So that is where we would support with permanent housing, and ongoing voluntary housing stabilization services. So uh, some things that are in the process, you know, I think we all know what is um, uh, first month's deposits, uh, application fees, uh, Furniture, moving furniture, those sorts of um, supportive services, as well as what does wraparound services look like? Oh, thank you, Kurt. <laughs> um, and that can also be provided by COC or COC agencies as well. So I'll pause here and see if anybody has any questions. Okay. So some of the challenges as, oh, yeah. Does that whole process? I, I am part of this, but I kind of yeah. do the referrals, and then I kind of, you know, it goes <laughs> goes into work yeah. or goes, right? Right. So once I do a referral, how long does it take to go to HUD and then to that whole it process? It goes through HUD. It would go or through a coordinated HAC. entry. Yeah. I'm sorry. And no, yeah. but coordinated entry. Once I do coordinated entry, then it goes to HAC, right? Yeah. So, so how long does that whole process kind of take? Yeah. So we send out. Uh, by twice a month, we send out referrals. Uh, it can be from, you know, at first it was uh, uh, batches of 25, and then it increased throughout time to really make sure that we open the floodgates for referrals mm -hmm. uh, within our COC. And so the referral process we do about two times a week, and that's based on acuity, right? So it just depends really when the participant takes that. The ice and we talk about this, you know, cars committees all the time. It's the importance of honesty, which is hard, uh, right, with the yes, but ask, uh, so that we can get as accurate of an acuity as possible. And um, so I would say, you know, in terms of that's our referral timeline when we do that, that's about, uh, we do that twice a month. And then uh, just depending on how long for HACM it takes for applications, they do that throughout uh, the referral process. Um, so it can take, they have uh, a process where they have uh, four, uh, they have four, what's it called, ongoing communication or trying to at least reach somebody. Um, but I can't speak to how long it would take on average for a pack up to reach a client. But I do know it takes about four calls. And I don't know, Zulika, if you want to add to that at all, if you're still on the call. No, I'm still here. But no, it really kind of varies. Uh, the time frame depends on the client or what. So uh, it's hard to just say, you know, in 10 days or five days. So it depends on how many documents they have and how long it takes them to go back and self-certify or get the remaining items that are requested. But um, I would say on the average case, if you have, if you have a landlord that you're already